that you might have technology, you might have social development, you might have high GDP, you might have high rates of literacy like the way Kerala has, but that is somehow not a guarantee that people are happy. Therefore, the happiness index is, for instance, if you look at Japan, which is a highly industrialized country with high rates of technology, but Japan is also known as the suicide capital of the world. You also have that, uh, what is now being referred to as the celibacy syndrome in uh, Japan. Similarly, if you look at a highly industrialized country like United Kingdom, you, have, uh, you would be surprised to know, many of you, that uh, they have recently started officially a ministry of loneliness. That loneliness has become a new epidemic uh, in uh, uh, much of Western European uh, countries. The uh, minister also already referred to the old age problem, that increasing age ratio all over the world, it is increasing uh, there because of the longevity, because of higher health standards, and there is a terrible uh, sense of loneliness that old age people suffer from. So the whole geriatrics has become a... So this entire process of social transformation, you know, that uh, Minister already referred, Honorable Minister, in terms of bringing about large scale social transformation. But increasingly, as societies move to greater social transformation, that social transformation itself is inducing stress, is inducing what we are referring to in emotion studies as emotional dissonance. And this is the place where uh, not many progressive social democratic states are able to focus. Because even uh, no, highly social democratic welfare oriented countries, like for instance Sweden, recently we witnessed uh, huge riots against uh, immigrants. So how does what, if there is no direct resonance of social development and welfare with the emotional indexing of uh, common people, then we'll have to take this as an independent variable, that what state needs to do. Uh, and that is where I think the right wing political mobilization across globe, not only in India, but look at uh, the rise of phenomena of Bolsonaro in Brazil, rise of Trump in the United States, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, lot of right wing <coughs> political mobilization across globe is uh, not based on uh, either the institutional dimension that Rajesh uh, focused upon or the social development, but it is based on the third dimension of uh, ethics and emotions. And this is where I think we'll have to take this entire ethical and emotional dimension uh, very seriously in terms of, because if we think that this is just an add-on value or this, is, this, could be, this could be easily accommodated as part of social development, contemporary Evidence shows that uh, that is not what is happening. This is where I think we'll have to bring back the question of culture in a very big way uh, in terms of our uh, social development indexing uh, process. I'll run through, I'll come back to theory at the end of uh, my talk, but let me run through the some of the recent popular uh, policies of the right wing and how have they mobilized a mass popular consent towards their policies. And mind you, this popular consent towards the right-wing uh, governments across the globe and right-wing political mobilization is happening in spite of failures on governance and social development index. If you look at even the current regime in the center, it's consent. Uh, we are not sure what is going to happen in 2024, but there's a sense that this government might sort of come back to power in spite of rather poor uh, governance record for the last 10 years. That on all fronts of illiteracy, education, employment, inflation, governance, law and order, this government has by and large at the center, I think has not delivered as one would have expected with a government with that kind of a mandate that it enjoyed. But yet, we are talking about a possibility, a clear possibility that there might be a return in 2024, and that is squarely based on a certain kind of a very deft mobilization of ethics and emotions of everyday life. And that's where I think 
progressive left social democratic governments and political groups, student bodies, research organizations, social organizations. I think we need to get a handle as to, because often the unpopular understanding, what the, we talk about the binary between reason, you know, legality and emotions. And by default, we push the domain of ethics, values, morality and emotions towards the right. But we think that is the domain where right operates and uh, left progressive do not have much stake. But I think it's now, I refer to this book that uh, Sohail was referring to in my recent book, I say that 28th century was the age of revolutions. It was a, it was a time when we were talking about big political changes. But 21st century, I remark, is the age of uh, emotions. That uh, whether are explicit emotions in the public sphere, uh, all that we thought emotions were in the private sphere or today in the public domain. And uh, that is uh, that we we'll have to develop uh, social technology, social collective methods of uh, how to mobilize positive sentiments of compassion, of coexistence, of love, care, and so on and so forth. So to give you an instance that how does right go about it, and then we can discuss in terms of an alternative uh, social progressive theory as to what could left and other progressive groups do about this. Look at the policies, recent policies of the right wing for the last 10 years. If you look at the uh, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, that this was one Abhiyan that is cutting across the uh, country all over. If you look at the economic survey report of 2018 and 19, uh, it noted that this policy, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, the way it was formulated was based on Nat Chiel. Some of you might, those of you following economic theory would know that it's, uh, and the report said, I quote it in a chapter titled, Policy for Homo Sapiens and not Homo Economicus. When they're, they're making this distinction between Homo Sapiens and Homo Economicus is that human beings do not respond only in legal rational terms. They do not operate only in terms of cost-benefit analysis, but they operate through everyday lay morality, everyday ethics, everyday emotions. And therefore, the right-wing social policy, I would, in fact, I did an entire piece in Node of Interest to look up a long article in the Development and Change Journal from Hague, where we, I tried to trace all the contemporary policies of right-wing, in, including Ujjwala scheme, uh, the demonetization, such Bharat, and I tried to explain that these were not merely economic or social policies in the traditional sense that we understand, but much of the policy making. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much of this policy making and policy imagination, in fact, was mobilizing uh, everyday sentiments, everyday feelings, a very late kind of uh, ethics that we actually invoke in our everyday interpersonal interactions. And I, therefore, I think we have to take that domain very, very uh, seriously. And in this report, which I was quoting, Economic Survey 2018, uh, it says that uh, the secret of success of uh, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan was a nuts theory, that is, to bring change in behavioral patterns by appealing to emotions. For instance, in Swachh Bharat, open defecation, how did the government go about campaigning about open defecation. It equated defecation to eating one's own excreta. Because the flies that sit on your excreta come back and the, therefore there was an element of shock and community shame that was being used in Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. It was not a state directing uh, policy, but it was a community that was being mobilized to kind of regulate new social behavior pattern. And this new logic that state and state laws alone cannot bring social change in terms of our everyday civility, everyday civic ethos. But it is a community that has to mobilize people collectively uh, through sentiments like shock, shame, guilt, disgust, humiliation, insult, uh, so on and so forth. If you look at their uh, toilet program that was there, it's also linked with the notion of purity, pollution, and the idea of cleanliness. In fact, they invoke these 
dominant imaginations, even in the communal polarization. So this whole idea that how does how have we come to this uh, you know this place from being a kind of secular democratic nation to a place where we are highly communally polarized today? It is not happening only through political slogan In a very subtle way, uh, the messages that are being passed are through this everyday things. Lot of this uh, clean India or a new India program. When I did my surveys, I was highlighted of this through um, uh, my Muslim friends. They suddenly uh, you know, brought to my notice that clean India uh, also had, or the new India also has the significations of cleansing of some kind of an ethnic cleansing of uh, minorities, religious minorities. But that notion of ethnic cleansing is then linked to popular understanding of purity and pollution, popular understanding of cleanliness, popular understanding of moral purity, popular understanding of what is being strong, what is being masculine. So these are this, this underbelly to this entire visible uh, no political uh, mobilization. Similarly, if you look at demonetization, which was an extremely popular uh, policy of this government, which in fact handed them the 2017 uh, grand victory in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, it was declared to be a kind of a war, uh, no, it was declared to be a policy to contain corruption. But if you follow the policies, later follow up campaign regarding demonetization, the goalposts kept changing, that they began by saying demonetization is about corruption. Then they said the demonetization is actually a war on terror, that it was to break the back of Islamic fundamentalism, break the back of uh, Maoism. And therefore, they drew a new link between suspect Muslim and a suspect citizen. That they know that under demonetization, every citizen is a suspect that unless you don't prove your income to be, has come from fair means, uh, it by default, it meant that your income is, uh, could be of a uh, fraudulent nature. It could amount to uh, corruption. Therefore, the burden of proof will lay on the so-called accused to prove that his income is from fair means. And one has to now, and then they move that, that goal post further. You know, if there were TV images, they suddenly discovered that uh, loads of cash was suddenly discovered floating in river Ganges. So look at this whole matrix as you understand, you kind of decode this entire matrix, that you begin with corruption, link the idea of corruption to terror, Islamic terror, and then link Islamic terror to cleansiness, clean, cleansing it from Ganges river, which has an overt uh, religious, Hindu religious symbolism. I think this, this idea of symbolism, that we often take it as, you know, just being theatrical or performative, I think deeply resonates with people's uh, everyday morality. That people represent themselves through this symbolism. So Ganges is a very powerful symbolism in the uh, Indian Hindu political and social imagination. Once you link corruption to Ganges and cleanliness, and then you link that cleanliness to the idea of Muslim. You don't have to state explicitly what the Muslim is, but by default, you are communicating to the mass that Muslim is something that needs to be purged. Something that new India, to have a clean India, then the, 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 the default factor that needs to be cleansed is the uh, Islamic content in it. I come to new education policy. But I've read this document very closely. And that the document, in fact, very clearly states that in, uh, sir, you spoke about education at length, uh, Minister spoke. We should see the long term, uh, you know, very ominous and dangerous possibilities of uh, new economic policy now. Government after government is being forced to implement this new education policy. And if you look at the content and intent of uh, this document, the document begins by enlarging the scope of education, and I quote here, beyond cognitive capacities such as critical thinking and problem solving. And it states that education is also about social, ethical, and emotional capacities and dispositions. 
the purpose of the education educational model education system is to develop it says good human beings capable of thought and action possessing compassion empathy courage resilience creative imagination and sound ethical morals values and therefore it says that modern education should be about character building and and personality building that needs to be linked to the project of nation building further values that the new nep course is a necessity for cleanliness spirit of service duty respect for public property and so on and so forth it goes on and on so this i think is a there is something for us to kind of pause and see that state perhaps for the first time in the modern context uh, is mobilizing everyday values ethics and emotions directly we always felt that emotions values ethics belong to the private domain as religious identities as our rituals and so on and so forth but i think we no longer live in that kind of a world and i don't think there is a way that the clock can be turned back it is not that tomorrow a new government comes this entire matrix that has been initiated can be suddenly kind of switched off that there is an impending need and this will have to understand it will need long time to explain it in a more theoretical and conceptual way as to why this kind of a change has come but this is not a change limited only to india and that's why it takes us beyond the right way right is only uh, is astute enough let me put it this way to kind of connect to this current global movement to briefly say that why this kind of a change has come that we are moving from economic notion of development to social development and now to human you know, kind of a happiness and emotional index becoming so central uh, and that becoming central to political mobilization that for a long time we believe through constitutional morality through institutions state should keep away and the state citizen is treated also as a private entity but that distinction between the public and the private uh, to a large extent is collapse that there is a new modern complexity that has emerged in societies where we do not have the privilege of the public and private and therefore state is directly mobilizing private values therefore this is a big debate those of you interested should read martha nasbaum's book uh, Uh, political emotions and therefore there he raises this question that we are squarely now in this global context where we perhaps do not have a choice liberalism thought that directly mobilizing morality or directly mobilizing emotions directly mobilizing private values would lead to a totalitarian state which is which, which is a fairly correct assessment of the situation that is why you see liberalism and constitutional democracies they give lot of things which are at core to our existence to the way we represent ourselves to the private domain whether it's religious identities whether it is a kind of civic sense we follow questions of civility questions of emotions so on and so forth but since globally i think this is to link with what rajesh was also like new liberalism also has uh no uh some relation to this but it will require a lot of time to explain why that has happened but if one were to agree with this broad thesis that we are in a modern complex in one sense post weberian kind of complex modern complex societies where you do not have those boundaries between public and private state and civil society civil society and market the way you are explaining the new liberal market has also pushed those boundaries away today you don't have distinction between market and society between state and civil society so in that kind of a context i think emotions and everyday ethics are becoming very very important and state mobilization state is no longer drawing its legitimacy from the old markers we began with political democracy you no know, in terms of civil rights free and fair elections then we move to social that for wherever we have left oriented governments social development plays such a big role in terms of gaining uh, social consent you know how you manage education system modern technology employment 
maintaining inflation. The, that was our traditional understanding. But in modern context, because of this sea change that has come about in the way post-complex societies are framing themselves in terms of collapse between public and private, suddenly emotions are on the street. Emotions are the way people are relating to the state. So po politics itself has got, in this sense, culturalized. As, as we all know that emotions always existed in the electoral process. You know, political mobilization itself meant for election had meant certain appeal. But today what you see is something very, very distinct. That emotions are public in the sense that they are, they, they are cut across uh, various social domains. In the sense that you are now evaluating economic and social policy through ethical and emotional strength. Liberalism and to some extent Marxism make a very clear distinction between these two. That economic indicators, analysis of economy in terms of equality, social equality, in terms of discrimination, all of that was a policy domain that is distinct from ethics and emotions. But today the change that perhaps has come, which I sense is through which people are evaluating the economic and social policy through itself, through emotions and ethics. So there are two ways of going about it. One, if you do not understand this, part of which has come from our liberal and Marxist traditions, that is where the right is taking advantage and directly mobilizing. It is seeing this context, this change context, and therefore it is gripping its, uh, so, uh, uh, its mobilization through these emotions and ethics. Two, we also feel that these emotions and ethical mobilization is an intrusion into the private sphere. And therefore, private questions of private liberty, civil liberties come into play. Therefore, we also think it, uh, we have to restrain. But I think we, we need to perhaps move away from those frames. And uh, the, in this new context, we will have to raise fresh kinds of questions in terms of how do progressive social democratic left uh, oriented states and political mobilization or how do they link to this entire new emotional content uh, that has kind of come about. That is where I will take you to the third dimension of uh, the economic variable. Now if you look at the Atmanirbhar policy, which we would all agree is a uh, uh, it's a neoliberal policy. Now, if you closely read and follow the campaigns of Atmanirbhal policy, they have not just announced it as an economic policy. And they are not even in terms of its legal uh, rationality. Atmanirbharta is being linked to a certain, such a certain kind of a new aspirational self. It is being linked to collapse of old kind of social hierarchies. It is being linked to collapse of all kind of patron-client relations. So people are being told that you can stand for yourself. You don't have to depend on state doors. We are today suddenly being told that welfare is an old kind of a feudal idea of a state, you know, inducing goals to you and making you continuously dependent on the state. So if you remember Prime Minister Modi's you know, sarcastic remark on MNREG policy in the parliament. He said that MNREG is a reminder of Congress failure because that old kind of dependence on uh, uh, on state continues. I think right is getting something right here that it is true that though it is converting that new kind of aspirations into a new neoliberal self, but it is true that there is this kind of a new aspirational self that has emerged post neoliberalism. And therefore, one has to then, if you, if you simply neglect that aspirational self, then we will leave that entire field to right-wing uh, political parties to mobilize that new aspirations. And since we neglect that, right is not only converting that aspirational self into new kinds of aggression, into new kinds of toxic majoritarianism, into new kinds of justification of public uh, display of violence that is found in mob lynching. In fact, in my book, I trace these uh, very intricate linkages that, you know, mob, what does mob lynching stand for in public today? That mob lynching is not merely about targeting Dalits or Muslims, 
but mob lynching is about certain justification of certain public expression of aggression. So today there is a certain legitimization of that aggression. So there is a very complex linkage between this public legitimation of aggression and the new liberal self and this idea of Atmanirmata. That you can stand for your own self. We'll have to draw those continues to understand why a right kind of draws this kind of a large popular consent because somewhere it is able to hook on to something that is real. The people are people are getting mobilized by the right for something else, but right is able to kind of connect to that new aspirational self. And what right does is that it connects to that new aspirational self and converts it that into aggression, legitimizing aggression and toxic majority. But that aspirational self is real. In the process of critiquing uh, mob lynching, in the process of critiquing toxic majoritarianism, in the process of critiquing aggression, if you lose sight of that aspirational self, then you actually lose sight of the reality under, underlying it. That why the right is getting this kind of a, what looks like a very voluntary response to their uh, you know, kind of majoritarian violent uh, politics. Now one might go back and ask, why is that people are, uh, why is that there is this uh, display of need for aggression? I have a long theory, again I don't have time to get, but let me briefly point you to one formulation that I make in the book that is, I think the modern context uh, is there is a mismatch between social democratization and economic equality. That is by and large across globe, socially Social process of social democratization, ethics of social democratization have gained certain acceptance. That is to treat women as equal, to not ill treat, let's say, other caste fellows. We may practice or not, but <clears throat> there is a social acceptance now that Dalits have to be treated equally, women have to be treated <clears throat> equally, uh, minorities have to be treated equally, children have to be treated equally. If you look at schools today, there is no physical corporal punishment in our schools anywhere in India. Parents have to treat children equally. Friends have to be treat each other with civility, dignity and respect. So the values of social democratization have spread across the world and more even in countries like India. This has happened due to many complex, one spread of education. I think spread of literacy you see across the world, it is in most of the country, it is now tracking beyond 60%. So I think spread of literacy, higher education, access to higher education is one big reason. Second big reason is market and technology. That you know, the spread of social media, spread of market, you know, market brings with it a certain notion of exchange relations. So that itself brings a sense of social dignity and equal interaction. Technology for the social media, availability of mobile phone, you know, Minister spoke about this aspect that everybody is today is in need of a mobile phone. Uh, what does this mobile phone do to you? Mobile phone is not just merely uh, you know, a mod modem of uh, communication. Yeah. <clears throat> but today in India, mobile phone is, is, a, is, a, is a gadget of empowerment. Why is it a gadget of empowerment? Look at is the idea of photography. Earlier, a good photographer had to capture a moment, you know, rare moment where somebody is talking to someone. Today with mobile phone, you create a moment. So you don't need, it. everybody today can be a great photographer. You don't need a great you know, camera or lens, but everybody, because of this ready availability of camera, uh, has become a great photographer. If you look at market, it's very interesting how this idea of what I'm explaining is the idea of social democratization. But look at uh, Gucci. Most of us can't afford Gucci and Louis Vuitton. But most of us can buy lookalike Gucci bags and Louis Vuitton bags. You know? I travel in Delhi, even in uh, you know, lower middle class colonies. Uh, I live in South Delhi. When I go to university, there are a lot of lower middle class colonies. And I see young girls going to college, all of them are hanging this Gucci bags. So these are all lookalike bags you know, you buy cheap on the roadside. Uh, jeans, uh, Armani shirts. What does this signify? 
this signifies a certain lateralization of social factors that everybody now thinks in terms of fashion technology. Nobody thinks of dress as just wearing any dress. But we are, we are all very conscious and that has gone down to even lower middle class. This is the symbol of social democratization. Technology, market, spread of education, and third is of course political democracy. That this value uh, in democracy that one vote means one value. That each person carries the same value. I think it has also spread this message of social democratization. But when people have begun to, at an imaginary level, have begun to uh, imagine themselves as equal, post neoliberalism, all evidence will show that inequalities have actually grown in the world, have grown at a very fast pace. Quantum of inequalities are growing, economic opportunities are shrinking, but Social democratization is working. So you can imagine the possible tension between social democratization and shrinking economic opportunities and growing economic inequalities. To a large extent, I would argue that it is this anomalous condition which is also allowing for a certain sanction to aggression, a certain sanction to you know, what I call as age of emotions. This is all Pankaj Mishra says, it is also an age of anger. So one has to take this entire new matrix that has come about in terms of how one understands this new emotional content and why states and political parties are directly mobilizing. Therefore, even policy making and governance are no longer based on the old method of data, evidence, collecting large scale statistics, looking at long term pro uh, proposals, uh, you know, we have five year plans. That is not how policies are being made across globe. If you look at the EWS policy, you know, reservations for economically weak within forward caste. It was based on absolutely no evidence. It was based on absolutely no data. You know, the cap in this policy is 8 lakh. Perhaps 80% of I think, upper caste would fall into that uh, uh, category. In fact, we don't have data, but this is a wild guess I'm taking. Maybe even 90% of caste Hindus would, I think, be eligible for this uh, AWS scheme. Now, but 8 lakh is a very high you know, limit in, uh, in the Indian co uh, conditions. But it yields political results because it's emotionally appealing. It has created a new constituency out of, out of nothing. It created this whole new sentiment that there are poor among the upper caste who are not being catered through by the traditional policy of reservation. So this entire business of social policy making, especially in left, we make through a lot of data. We go into a lot of scientific evidence through long-term data collection. But that is not what is resonating on the ground. This whole old kind of scientific uh, temper. But it is on the hands-on solutions which are emotionally appealing. Therefore, there's a new subtle sentiment. Look at the movements that have taken place in India in the last uh, four or five years. Movements by Jats, by Patidas, by Gujars. These are all relatively developed communities wanting to be recognized as backward. This is based on a public sentiment. This is based on a hyper sense of victimhood. I think we have to take all of this, you know, uh, serious. That I, from a liberal constitutional point of view, it will look unreasonable. It might even look irrational. It might look like this. This have no social basis. But what where they have a social basis is where I explain this. This discrepancy between social democratization and shrinking economic opportunities. People are asserting. This is my large base uh, submission would be that uh, there is something positive about this movement. There is something positive about this shift. Obviously, we are all concerned about the illiberal turn of political mobilization. Uh, we would be concerned about the aggression that is visible. Uh, we would be concerned about the violence that is visible. Uh, but behind all of that, there is, I think, this immense potential for a non-conformist Self. There's an immense potential of the popular domain becoming very assertive. Since our entry point of the liberal left is in terms of the legal, rational, institutional, policy-making model, 
uh, we, uh, we are uh, by default rejecting all of this as being either toxic majoritarianism or illiberal. Self. There is that illiberal content, but there's more to it. Therefore, by and large, populist mobilizations resonate with something that has happened, complex changes that have happened uh, in the current moment. Therefore, the question for alternative political mobilization, that what can we do in such a context? That's, the, that's a big, big question. That where does political groups like left, social democratic progressives like? I think we'll have to now recalibrate some of our traditional formulations. Already in political theory, there is a big shift in debate between equation between culture and economy, and between social policy and uh, private domain, for instance. That now we'll have to understand that economy or politics uh, is never in that professional bare sense. They are, they, they are always mediated by culture, culture and symbolism, everyday ethics at everyday portions. So it's not that we need to give up our agenda of social development. It's not that we give up our agenda of focus on literacy. But we, one has to focus a little more on the right kind of symbolism, right kind of an attachment to everyday ethics and emotions has to be developed. It is not an automatic link. It is not that today to you know, have the kind develop more schools, it is naturally going to you know, uh, translate into popular concept. No, that's not how things are working. <clears throat> that building of school has to be mediated through a more symbolic order. There is a notion of performance. Uh, I don't have time to get into some of these theories of performance, dramaturgy, and uh, uh, no, uh, public demonstrative symbolism, so on and so forth. But broadly, it would mean to say that <clears throat> today we have a different self in the public domain. And that self cannot be mobilized through bland uh, political and institutional language. This, I think, is in itself, uh, as I said, a, symptom, a certain kind of a symptom of uh, social democratization. It's a, it is, it, in one sense, it's a positive uh, sentiment because democracy in that sense has become very populist. Everybody today thinks he or she can speak. He or she has a strong opinion. Whether it's based on data or not, but that very sentiment that people can express themselves without fear, uh, without sense of self-doubt, uh, is what democracy was meant to do to popular domain. That was the assumption behind democracy. Today we are seeing the result of that. And, and those of us who strongly supported democracy are also those of us who were terribly traumatized by the consequence. That this is what democracy meant. When it's actually happening, uh, we are terribly traumatized by it. But I think instead of trauma, instead of declaring it as authoritarian, totalitarian, as I said, it has all these features. But what we should be focusing on is that how do we uh, re-political mobilize on the basis of these new sensibilities that have come on the ground? How do we mobilize? The mobilizing, for instance, in our traditional left and liberal political circles, our natural common sense tells us that mobilizing on the base of emotions is either irrational or it's only totalitarian. We think it's right which does that business of developing on the basis of symbolism and emotions, and the left parties don't do that. I think those kind of old binaries we need to give up. And we need to think that every day, Ethics. There is also compassion in everyday ethics. Myths and mythologies, religious symbolism, also has sense of uh, equality. There are also discourses of uh, rebellion. There are also discourses. If you look at entire uh, alternate tradition in Hinduism, from Bhakti tradition to your own Narayan Guru here in Kerala, these are all symbols of left for me. This is not pure just culture that needs to be left out. This is not a question of just emotions that should be left out. Wherever this kind of social democratic religious reform has happened, whether it's Narayan Guru here or Basavana in uh, Karnataka, those are the places where right is facing also a challenge. So my plea would be that our modality of political mobilization, our symbolism of political mobilization has to become more cultural. It has to be rooted in everyday culture and everyday ethics. And this needs a certain creative effort on part of us to kind of appropriate popular myths, appropriate mythologies, 
appropriate religious uh, symbolism, appropriate social reform symbolism. The Narayan Guru is such a powerful uh, symbolism in, in the context of Kerala. There is no reason why we should think that this is just something that is cultural. Because often from a left progressive point, we collapse culture quickly to conservatism. That we are terribly uncomfortable with this dealing with cultural questions. We have terrible discomfort in terms of dealing with questions of ethnic identities or with local. I think we'll have to give up most of those inhibitions and take a relook at what is more positive in this popular domain. And a political mobilization around that, uh, I feel, would be a more sustainable, a more profitable, a more progressive thing that one can do in the current context. I'll stop here. Thanks for the opportunity.